as a commander, ask myself that question many times, and I really, really struggle with it. So undoubtedly to the families of the dead and wounded and of those still serving in Afghanistan. Is it worth the price? Welcome to Four Corners. The war in Afghanistan has now gone longer than World Wars I and II combined and will be far longer than Vietnam by the final troop withdrawals in 2014. Australia went in to support the US in the wake of September 11, but like America itself, is now looking for a respectable way out, with Afghanistan's security forces inheriting sole combat responsibility in less than three years. The latest Taliban attacks in Kabul overnight once again underscore just how tough that task is going to be. The cost in human life and money has been very substantial over time. Thousands dead, including civilians, $500 billion in military spending by America and $7 billion by Australia to the end of this year. Some frontline analysts who know the situation intimately say the success that's been claimed has been overstated. One veteran civil aid expert says locals believe the Taliban could retake the province of Uruzgan within two weeks of an Australian troop withdrawal. Tonight, Four Corners looks at what Australia's objectives were going in in late 2001 and then going back a second time and asks leading experts and Afghan war veterans what has been achieved. I'll then seek answers from Defence Minister Stephen Smith. First, the story from reporter Jeff Thompson. Australian troops putting their lives on the line in Afghanistan. Yeah, someone go down low, down low, go in. Just as they do each and every day. Fighting a bloody and expensive war our government rarely wants us to witness. Back! Move, move, move! Go! No, that wasn't it! That was. Oh, the number of coalition soldiers killed here will soon exceed the near 3,000 civilians who died in the September 11 attacks. 32 of them have been Australians. Five objectives have been repeatedly stated as the reasons for Australia's war in Afghanistan. Objective one, honor the ANZUS defense treaty with the United States. On September 11, 2001, then Prime Minister John Howard was in Washington. His response to the terrorist attacks was as immediate as it was visceral. Uh, we will stand by them, we will help them, uh, we will support uh, actions they take to properly retaliate. Uh, in relation to these acts of bastardry. I certainly don't have any regrets about Australian involvement, the instantaneous commitment to stand beside the Americans. And I believe very strongly that if we hadn't have gone into Afghanistan, then there could well have been uh, multiple further attacks. <laughs> I was making it very plain that we would stand beside the Americans because given what had happened to them, uh, it was a time for 100% allies, not 70 or 80% allies. And I did see that attack, and I still do, as being an attack on our way of life as much as an attack on the American way of life. And I spoke, I'm sure, at that time for the great bulk of the Australian people. For the first time in its 50-year history, Australia invoked the ANZUS Treaty. Good afternoon. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps 
and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Australia, Germany and France have pledged forces as the operation unfolds. Well, it's always of advantage to this country to have a close alliance with the most powerful democracy in the world, militarily speaking and economically speaking. I think that's self-evident to the Australian people and there was a time in history when uh, the strength of that alliance was important to Australia's survival, namely in World War II. At its heart, it's about supporting an alliance with the United States. That's what got us into this when the ANZUS Treaty was invoked. Is it worth it? I, as a commander, ask myself that question many times and I really, really struggle with it. The only way I can see through this so that I can sleep at night is to differentiate, to say it's not worth it for the lives that you lose. You could never look at any soldier, sailor or airman and say your life's forfeit for some political purpose. That's just unacceptable. But at the highest level of strategy, and in the dirty, ugly world of international relationships where it's you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, that those lives become less important. And taking that longer term view, that hard nosed, real politic view that politicians do and must, it's worth it, but not at the human level. At some point you reach a level where you say, you know, enough's enough and it's time for us to focus on providing legitimate support to the Alliance but in ways that don't expose young Australians to potentially being the last person to die uh, in a war that we're leaving anyway. <laughs> It's absolutely clear that Australia has done everything and more that was expected of it. So in terms of uh, supporting and honouring the ANZUS Alliance, I think we can be very clear that we've achieved that objective. Objective two, deny Al-Qaeda a safe haven in Afghanistan. Denying Al-Qaeda a safe haven has been the most consistently stated justification for the war in Afghanistan. On the morning of September 11, 2001, I was in the White House attending the senior staff meeting of the National Security Council. Within minutes, we knew this was Al-Qaeda and we knew we'd have to do something about Afghanistan, but there was literally no war plan for going into Afghanistan. What we had was a CIA plan to send in a small number of CIA operatives with several million dollars in walking around money to try to bribe Taliban commanders over to our side and a concept of operations. We would provide air power and the Northern Alliance would provide the manpower on the ground to topple the Taliban. It turned out to be a very simple plan and one that worked remarkably quickly, perhaps almost too easily for what came afterwards. From the outset, Australia was part of the hunt for Al Qaeda. 150 Special Forces troopers landed in Afghanistan in December 2001. 
It's estimated there were about 5,000 Al-Qaeda fighters in the country at the time. But even before that job was done, the United States was distracted by Iraq. People in the field in Afghanistan in late December or mid to late December 2001 were already losing support from Central Command Headquarters and losing the attention and planning support and air power that they needed to close the door on Osama bin Laden because the planners had been directed to start focusing on Iraq. I was aware that America had the possibility of a military operation in Iraq in mind, although it would be wrong to say that any final decision had been taken uh, in two, at the end of 2001. Osama bin Laden escaped to Pakistan and since 2002 it has remained the main base of al-Qaeda's operations in the region. The only way we can go after them in Pakistan is from bases in Afghanistan. The SEAL team that killed Osama bin Laden flew out of a helicopter base in Afghanistan. Had it tried to accomplish that mission from an aircraft carrier in the Indian Ocean, you can be sure it would have failed. It's just too far. The drones that put unremitting pressure on Al-Qaeda every day in Pakistan all fly out of Afghanistan. Without bases in Afghanistan, we'd be able to put no pressure on Al-Qaeda in Pakistan. And I think we saw very dramatically on May 1st last year that Pakistan is in a very ambiguous relationship, even with the highest leaders of Al-Qaeda, like Osama bin Laden, who wasn't hiding in a cave in the mountains. He was hiding in the front yard of the Pakistani army. Nobody can guarantee uh, whether or not Al-Qaeda can come back. What is in all circumstances going to be a very weak Afghan state will not be able to prevent some Al-Qaeda people coming there, basing themselves there, travelling through. But what I think can be prevented, uh, certainly in the context of a peace deal with the Taliban, if that is achieved, is to prevent Al-Qaeda setting up the kind of bases and training camps that it had before 9-11 in Afghanistan. Objective three, topple the Taliban regime. Before the September 11 attacks, Afghanistan under Taliban rule was already a pariah state. When the Pakistan-backed movement took power in 1996, it imposed a strict regime of Sharia law and killed thousands of civilians. The Taliban's brutal treatment of women attracted international condemnation. But it was their refusal to unconditionally surrender Osama bin Laden and other al-Qaeda leaders which led to war with the United States and allies like Australia. The Taliban were brilliantly and very quickly defeated in 2001. It's clear in retrospect that they'd lost the confidence of the vast majority of Afghans. But with a safe haven in Pakistan and with the active support of the Pakistani Army and Intelligence Service, the Taliban have staged one of the great military comeback stories of the last 50 years. They came back again in 2003 and with support they increased their activity in 2005. So there was a real time window there of two years at least where it would have been quite possible to craft a new structure that worked uh, and, and was based on a, a genuine reconciliation, it, it, but it didn't happen. By 2002, so confident was the coalition that the job of defeating the Taliban was done that Australia withdrew virtually all combat troops from Afghanistan, only to send them back in 2005. I mean, you might argue, well, we should have left them all there, but I can tell you, if we'd left them, we had all left all of our forces there, 
no matter what anybody was saying about Iraq, we'd have been heavily criticised uh, for keeping forces uh, in a country after the immediate objective had been achieved. Bear in mind that the objective was not indefinite occupation. A resurgent Taliban reached the peak of its success in 2009 when it threatened 80% of Afghanistan. In April of that year, Kevin Rudd announced a 40% increase in Australian troops, bringing the total number on the ground to 1,550, more than 10 times Australia's original commitment in 2001. We can only do, in my view, what we've been asked to do. And from a military commander, when I was there, all I could ask of my soldiers was to do the mission that we've been assigned. Train the, uh, the Afghan forces in Arizgan province to the best of our ability. And that's all we can do. We can't solve Afghanistan. Australia can't solve Afghanistan. In America, President Obama bowed to pressure from his Afghanistan generals and agreed to a troop surge of 30,000. These additional American and international troops will allow us to accelerate handing over responsibility to Afghan forces and allow us to begin the transfer of our forces out of Afghanistan. Debate still rages over how effective Obama's Afghanistan surge has been. The Taliban have adopted more of an urban assassination and bombing tactic because they can't operate so freely in the countryside. And as a consequence, you know, it, it, there's an improvement in security and stability in the countryside. Um, that said, the, in the same time frame, the insurgency has gotten worse in the east and has spread to the north and the west. So uh, this is a side effect of not having enough troops to do the job across the country simultaneously. We had to press in one area and we certainly have reduced Taliban activity there, but they've sort of spread around and, and moved to other areas as we've done that. At some point, this will fall apart. And if we don't change anything, my assessment is that this will end in a strategic defeat for the United States and the entire coalition. And at some point, that cannot be hidden by positive words. If all of your actual evidence shows that when you leave somewhere, the Taliban immediately comes back in, then what possible rationale could you place to say, but this time when we leave 23,000 in the next six months, well, that's going to work. That's going to stay. Or and then, you know, the, the, the remainder of the 68,000 by the end of 2014, ostensibly, and all the rest of the NATO forces, upon what do you have to base that that's going to succeed and they're going to stand when they haven't everywhere else? Where are we still there? The problem was that the United States then went on after 2001 to develop this idea of essentially eliminating the Taliban altogether, excluding the Taliban from Afghanistan. As has become very apparent, that cannot be done. Objective four, help the Afghan people through development, education and democracy. The war may have begun as a pursuit of al-Qaeda, but lofty ideals of helping Afghanistan's people were quickly grafted on to justifications for the invasion. We see the work that's being done and the progression being done. I think if we weren't here, the progression of uh, construction would be extremely slow. They would still carry on with their lives, but uh, we're giving, giving them a step up, I believe, so. It took seven weeks to, to kick you know, the remaining al-Qaeda guys out of, uh, out of Afghanistan. Then at the Bonn conference in late 2001 and early 2002, there was a very maximalist set of nation-building objectives kind of tacked onto that military objective. And I think over time, people have realised that that was just far too ambitious a set of ideas for the resources that we allocated to it. It's been estimated that of the $62 billion in aid pledged by international donors since Bonn in 2001, only 5% reached local Afghans. 
incredible sums have gone to Western officials and aid workers in Kabul. Even bigger sums have gone to contractors with enormous profits, enormous overheads, enormous payments for security. Huge payments have been made to consultants, um, many of whom have hardly actually done any work in Afghanistan. And then, of course, when money is given to the Afghan authorities, so much of it has been stolen and disappeared in the form of corruption. Do you know Afghans call international assistance uh, aeroplane aid? I don't know if you've ever heard that term. They say it flies from the West, touches down in Afghanistan and flies right back to the West. I think it's very true that uh, a lot of the money that's been allocated has been wasted or has actually been had a negative effect because it's, it's created money that's either gone to the enemy or gone to corrupt warlords or corrupt officials who've then used it to oppress or abuse the ordinary population and it's created instability. The opportunities now available to women and girls have certainly improved, particularly in major cities like Kabul. Only 5,000 girls were in school in 2001. Now 2.7 million are being educated across Afghanistan. Quantitatively, there are much more schools. There's probably from less than 30, now 205. There's madrasas, but most of the gains are for boys. So, I mean, you could say they're making some progress in education, but you unfortunately still have a fairly conservative society. And so why things for women have changed, there's a big, big difference between urban and rural centres. Some infrastructure in Afghanistan, like new roads, might be irreversible. But progress in areas such as women's rights and democracy may not survive the departure of most international forces in 2014. There's no doubt that, that there have been some things succeeded. Uh, you know, we've built who knows how many schools. Uh, women have, I mean, they're serving in parliament. Uh, they have rights here and there. Um, there is, you know, there's roads built. There, there has been some infrastructure done and beyond question. There are some areas, especially in, in the southern part of the country, where it's more secure now than it was. No question about that. Those are all true statements. But they also, almost none of them matter. Virtually everywhere that we have picked our boots up, and this is open source, this is not classified information, you can read this online, the Taliban immediately comes back in to take over. It's not like we've failed to achieve this worthy objective of democracy. We actually sold the Afghans down the river in a sense because we've put in place this very centralised, very controlling government that has no plans to listen to what they want. And I think that's a really significant problem in Afghanistan. It's not like a minor issue that we've got to fix. It's the heart of the problem. I mean, I, lo I want to see democracy everywhere, but I'm not starry-eyed enough to think you're going to have it flourishing in Afghanistan in 10 years' time. Uh, we, we were never into that. We were always into retaliating and denying the capacity for Al-Qaeda to come again, and we were successful in that, very successful. But the ongoing conflict has meant that, very far from being helped, a growing number of ordinary Afghans are paying the ultimate price. Last year, the number of civilian deaths went up for the fifth year in a row. More Afghan civilians were killed last year alone than the number of people who lost their lives in 2001's September 11 attacks. The UN estimates the Taliban were responsible for 77% of those deaths. The population is the soft target for the Taliban. And throughout history, insurgents have always preferred to target members of their own community that collaborate with the outsider rather than target the outsider directly. Uh, and that's still the pattern in Afghanistan. It doesn't matter to the Afghan people whether they kill them 
or, or the, the Taliban kills them or whether our accidents kill them. We, we brag about, oh, it's only uh, 23 percent is, is the coalition and, and 77 percent is the Taliban. They don't care. And, and you can read open source material from the local media that they confirm this. It doesn't matter to them who does the killing. It matters to them that we can't stop it. I mean, for them consistently to say, yes, we honorable can leave in 2014 and we're not leaving behind a mess, you have to say, yes, we're on track. Yes, we're making progress. Yes, things are getting better. And sometimes you, you think they're taking crazy pills or you kind of want to smoke what they're smoking, you know. But sometimes I sometimes would like to get a general and sit to him and say, do you really believe that? Or is it something you have to say because you have now those years left and you want to get you guys out? Objective five, train Afghanistan's army and police to secure their country. Since President Obama named 2014 as an exit date, the NATO mission has focused on increasing and improving local forces so they can take the lead in securing Afghanistan. The stated goal is to leave behind 195,000 competent Afghan soldiers and 157,000 police. But the challenges are formidable. Afghanistan's army is plagued by corruption, desertion, illiteracy and drug use. The reputation of the police is worse. I think we've made massive progress, but I think we still have a huge way to go. And it's certainly not a done deal that we're going to get to where we need to be by the end of 2014. I'm, I'm quite sceptical about that. The goal for us is to train a single brigade. Now, a brigade of the Afghan army is around 2,000, 2,500 people, and it comprises about four groups called Kandaks of about 600 or so. And that's essentially the fighting force that we're trying to train up. Now, that force is patchy in terms of its quality and the training it's received. Part of it's going OK. Parts of it have a long way to go. But it is, as, a, as an organisation, moving in the right direction. There has been progress, but as late as last October, no Afghan police units and only one army battalion were judged by the US Defence Department to be effective without international support. I mean, let's, tell me where the logic is in this. What we have failed to do in 10 full years of war, now into the 11th year. We've already started the return of troops to the tune of 10,000. 23,000 are physically in the process of getting ready to leave. And what we have not been able to do in 10 years, now then we're going to say with a com continual bleeding off of troops and the money that goes along with it, uh, we are going, the Afghan guys are going to accomplish what they could not do with our presence there without our presence there. Australian special forces in Uruzgan have been criticised for working not with government security forces, but the private militia of a local strongman and now police chief, Matiula Khan. Sometimes the people we deal with are not attractive people. Sometimes they've got to where they are by getting blood on their hands. It would be impossible to find someone in Afghanistan, I would judge, who hasn't got some blood on their hands somewhere if they're in a position of power. Um, we just have to accept that. It's ugly, it's unattractive, it's un-Australian, but that's the way it is. So we need to work with it. You can't say we're pro-government, pro we're pro-governance, and then you work with groups like that. Suzanne Schmeidel was recently contracted by AusAid to assess local perceptions of Australia's efforts in Uruzgan. She is not optimistic about the province's chances after 2014. A local colleague of mine, you know, when I discussed with him about whether Matiula would be able to hold, he said that he'd think that the Taliban might be able to retake Uruzgan in two weeks after the Australians withdraw. 
all the evidence suggests that the Afghan security forces will not be strong enough uh, to defeat or contain the Taliban after 2014, the, the way things are going. Uh, there have been so many cases in, in recent months, both of attacks on by Afghan soldiers on Western forces, but also so many cases uh, of uh, rape, extortion, kidnapping, murder by the Afghan police. That isn't to say that the Afghan state will com collapse completely, but in my view, without massive Western support, uh, this army will not be capable of holding most of the Pashtun areas uh, against Taliban attack. Australian troops have been attacked by the Afghan forces they are training three times now. Incidents known in the military as green on blue attacks. There have been about 30 such incidents across the coalition since 2007, resulting in 80 deaths. 75% of them have happened since President Obama announced an exit strategy. The people have thought, well, the international community is leaving. I've got to show that I'm uh, not a collaborator. And the way that I do that is I turn on the international community now to demonstrate that anti-coalition credential while there's still time. And I think that, that not only explains green on blue, it also explains some of the behaviour we've seen from very senior Afghan leaders, including President Karzai. Hamid Karzai, who is due to step down as president in 2014, has repeatedly flagged his interest in talks with the Taliban he now calls his brothers. Ten years ago, the Taliban were regarded as an enemy barely worth talking to. Now negotiating with them may be the only plausible path to peace. There can be no political solution to this war unless it's an Afghan political solution. We can't have a peace agreement between Brussels and Kandahar. We need to have a peace agreement between Kabul and Kandahar. The very fact that now the Taliban is thinking about talks is a very encouraging one. But they will only be willing to think about talks as long as they believe that we're not going to just simply walk away 100% from Afghanistan, either in 2012 or in 2014. But the Taliban says there can be no settlement unless international forces leave. If the United States is determined to keep military bases and special forces in Afghanistan for a long period after 2014, then yes, that will make a settlement with the Taliban impossible. The Taliban have stated repeatedly uh, that they cannot possibly agree to that. And so, a war soon to become Australia's longest continues with no imminent victory or political solution in sight. We are doing all we can do in the military side and we're actually doing a pretty good job. But to what end? Where are we heading? And we're not... I don't see the political solution that needs to be in place to allow, uh, allow us to leave in 2014. So that, that, to my mind, is the real problem, and it's much bigger and harder to deal with, actually, than the military stuff. To be frank, it's a bit heartbreaking. It has been a bit heartbreaking for me and some of my colleagues and friends to see how potentially a very, very good opportunity and chance in Afghanistan was squandered. If you're just tossing away laugh, whether Afghan laugh or American laugh or, or Australian laugh, if there's not some benefit to the coalition, to the country, to the people of Afghanistan, then you've got to ask, why are we doing this? Why are we still doing this? A question that gets harder to answer for public consumption as the years roll by, but still confronts Defence Minister Stephen Smith, who's just come back from Afghanistan and joins me now. Stephen Smith, it seems to me that it's not just a case of why are we still there, but uh, when the coalition has gone, what will it leave behind that will justify the cost? Well, we're still there because it's in our national interest, it's in our national security interest to stay and finish the job. Uh, and the job won't finish 
uh, at the end of 2014, which is why for the last 12 months or more, Australia has been arguing and saying to its international partners that we need to focus on the post-2014 international community contribution. Uh, and that's now seeing a couple of very important issues crystallising for the Chicago NATO Leaders Summit, which the Prime Minister will attend. Firstly, resourcing the Afghan National Security Forces after 2014, and secondly, uh, what international community support will there continue to be to give support not just to the security forces, but also to the Afghan institutions. The American drawdown of troops is on the way. We've seen again overnight from Kabul the presence of the Taliban is still very much there. You heard Colonel Davis say, if with all the might of the coalition forces combined with the Afghan military has not been able to stop the killing, has not been able to rid Afghanistan of the insurgency, why is that suddenly going to be possible with Afghan forces alone after 2014, no matter how much money you pump in from the outside on top of the billions and billions that's already been spent? Well, uh, Colonel Davis's analysis is not one that I share. It's not one shared by his uh, military seniors, nor is it shared by effectively everyone I spoke to in uh, Afghanistan, in Kandahar, in Tarankot and in Kabul last week. But, Where... but that doesn't surprise me because for any of the senior military or governments to acknowledge any right in what he says is to acknowledge failure. Well, I'm not... Uh, saying that uh, we've got rose-coloured glasses on or, or that we are starry-eyed about this. It's difficult, it's dangerous. Risks continue, very high risk, whether it's safe havens in Pakistan, whether it's issues about corruption or drugs or governance so far as uh, Afghan governance and institutions are concerned. But the overnight uh, events in Kabul really show, in my view, a number of things. Firstly, the entire response was handled by Afghan national security forces themselves. They weren't handled by international security assistance force uh, competence. They were handled by the Afghans themselves and handled on the advice I have pretty well. Secondly, we've seen, and I've been saying this for more than 12 months, we will continue to see the Taliban and other associated groups resorting to greater reliance upon the roadside bombs, the IEDs, but even more so, greater reliance upon the high-profile propaganda-motivated attacks, including suicide bombings, including suicide bombings using children. We've seen more of that. That's because they haven't been able to make up the ground that they've lost in the field. And that's been the case, really, for the last 18 months. Uh, the surge, which was United States and uh, International Security Assistance Force forces, has been effective. They have not been able to take back any ground at all. And that's why they've been resorting to the high profile attacks. And that's also why, for the first time, we've seen clear indications that they are contemplating having talks. Now, it's at early stages, but it does underline the point Australia has made for a number of years, that this can't and won't just be a combat or a military solution. It also needs to be a political solution. Well, you disagree with Colonel Davis. Do you also disagree with uh, Suzanne Schmeidel, who has been there since 2002, who has significant credibility, who was lead author in a report that was commissioned by AusAid, an Australian government agency? She says, when she hears coalition generals talking about being on track, making progress, things getting better, she thinks they're taking crazy pills. Well, she has been dealing quite correctly with the development issues and the governance issues and the services on the ground. Uh, and I have repeatedly make, made the point that in terms of progress or improvement, uh, we find at first on the security front, particularly with uh, the army, there's no doubt the police are lagging behind. But where we find Afghanistan at its worst, uh, the delivery of services and the provision of basic facilities to their people. And when I met with the governor and the deputy governor of Oroscon province, the police chief, the director of the National Director of Security and the army uh, commander of the 4th Brigade, uh, to a man, they all said the most important thing now are not security issues, the most important things now are developing and providing the services. And whilst we have made... But this is, on a, this is, a, ticking, this is a ticking time bomb. A deadline has been created. How you work that well, deadline out, I don't know, but a deadline has been created and the time is ticking down. Well, the deadline is transition to Afghan 
national security forces mm. to enable them to take lead responsibility for security. But, but how, by, how, no, much no, but by, how much confidence by, by the do you time, think the people of Afghanistan out in the countryside and provinces like Uruzgan actually have that their government, which has a very low credibility in, in Afghanistan, can hold the line against the Taliban. And what do you say again to Susan Schmeidel when people say to her in Oruzgan that the Taliban could be back? We'll just move back in within two weeks of Australia leaving. Well, by the, let me, to, to finish my answer, by the time you get to the middle of 2013, you'll have all of the population of Afghanistan under lead responsibility. Uh, and that will be the case with the International Security Assistance Forces essentially playing a background and advisory role, a combat role when necessary or required, until the end of 2014. But at 2014, uh, the international community contribution doesn't stop, and it doesn't stop there. But the combat, on the combat front, it does. While Australian soldiers now are being killed by Taliban bombs, President Karzai is referring to the Taliban as his brothers. How do you process that? Well, what President Karzai is saying there is what I've said in my own language, which is not only does there need to be enhanced security and a military or combat solution which affects uh, peace and security in Afghanistan, there also has to be a political reproachment, a political settlement. And we're seeing the early signs of what the Afghans describe as reintegration, where uh, fighters on the ground who've been running with the Taliban are now coming to realise that in many instances they're, they're not fighting international security assistance force soldiers from overseas, they're fighting their own uh, countrymen, their own brothers. And they are both ways. And, and they Works are laying, both ways in a civil war. And they are laying down their arms. Mm. Now, the, the legitimate point which, which uh, uh, development assistance officers make is that we are coming off a very low base so far as the provision of services is concerned. It's also the case that the further away you are from the population centres, the more difficult it is to control security and the more difficult it is to provide services on the ground, whether you're a development assistance partner like Australia or whether you are a provincial or a central government. But at the same time you want a local political solution, you're also saying that the international presence is not going away, it's still going to be there, partly in terms, I mean the Americans are making clear, they want to man maintain bases of some description there because they want to continue to drop bombs on uh, on, um, on insurgency targets, whether it's, uh, whether it's extremist Taliban or whether it's Al-Qaeda, in Pakistan, which they say they can't do unless they maintain a base there, the Taliban say no political settlement until all foreign presence is gone. So well, two, the longer you well, stay, in their terms, the longer you put off any real solution. Well, two things. Firstly, any political solution can only be an Afghan-led political solution. It can only be brought about mm. by the Afghan government speaking to other parties, including the Taliban. Uh, and the establishment of the Qatar office of the Taliban is a very early sign that the Taliban may well be interested in going down that road. They'll only do that if they believe two things. If they believe they can't win militarily and they've made no, no ground up in the field for effectively 18 months. And if they also believe the international community there is there for the long haul. And that's why it's been so important for Afghanistan to enter into long-term strategic partnerships with uh, NATO. It will affect one with the United States. It's affecting long-term strategic partnerships with India, with Germany, with France. Even in retirement, General, General Cantwell still clearly lives with the anguish of seeing his soldiers die. And clearly he's still struggling to justify it. Do you struggle to justify continuing to put Australian lives on the line for what so many see, including frontline experts, as a dubious outcome. Well, every time, Kerry, there's a fatality. It sends a shockwave through ministers, it sends a shockwave through uh, chiefs of services and chiefs of defence forces, it sends a, a shockwave through uh, the service itself. But, and, and look, I, I don't want to be, and I'm not being a cynic on this, but we've seen spin related to war uh, in a big way, really, since Vietnam. You have to say these things. You have to say these things. But do you really struggle for what I've said, according to many experts, is a dubious outcome? That's my emphasis, dubious well, outcome. I am absolutely of the view that we are there and continue to be there in our national security interests, that we can't allow Afghanistan to again become a breeding ground for international terrorism. As we speak, Umar Patek is being tried in uh, Indonesia. Uh, he was the bloke who built the Bali bomb. He was trained in Afghanistan. 
we can't allow this to occur again because Australian citizens will be at risk. But, but, but Pakistan speak, is the new breeding ground. What are you going to do? Invade Pakistan eventually? Well, Pakistan is one of the very significant issues and problems that we have. You can do one of two things with Pakistan. You can continue to engage, as we do strongly, as the United States continues to do, despite while, while, the while dropping bombs or, from drones, or ignore it. Mm. Uh, Pakistan is uh, is a significant uh, and complex nation, and it can't be ignored. And we engage with Pakistan as effectively as we can. But, Kerry, when I speak to my defence ministerial colleagues. They suffer the same array and range of emotions that I do in the face of fatalities. When I ring my US counterpart, my New Zealand counterpart, my UK counterpart, in the face of fatalities on their side, they all suffer the same emotions. But in the end, governments make decisions to protect and defend the national security interests of their nation. And we very strongly believe that when we went in there, it was the right thing to do. We continue to believe that, not just because we're there with the United States, we are there under a United Nations mandate, as we've been for a decade, with 50 other countries serving the international community's national security interests. And that's why it's the right thing to do, and that's why the 32 families who grieve on a daily basis are not doing that grieving in vain. Stephen Smith, thanks for talking with us. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks very much.